In the last century, over 100 people have lost their lives in the most horrific circumstances. People turning into human fireballs in their own homes. Flames roaring out from their insides. Spontaneous human combustion. Could mysterious forces have caused victims to be consumed by flames emitted and sustained by their own bodies? I'm Bruce Dickinson, lead singer of Iron Maiden, and I don't buy supernatural theories. So I'm going to meet the people who have witnessed the flames firsthand. He had a slit in his stomach, and the flames were coming out much like a blowtorch. And through a series of elaborate and sometimes dangerous scientific experiments, <laughs> I'm going to put the phenomenon to the test. Jolly good. I don't believe in science fiction. I do believe in science fact. Canterbury Road in Folkestone, an ordinary street, you would think. But this ordinary street has a far from ordinary history because in 1987, one of its residents spontaneously combusted. Barry Sudane lived in a flat above what used to be a baker's shop here at number 78. But on December the 27th, he joined a highly select group of people. He became one of only 120 people whose deaths are thought to have been triggered by their bodies erupting into flames. Little is known about Barry's life, but the manner of his death has become a matter of intense interest. When his body was discovered, Detective Superintendent Nigel Cruttenden was the senior forensics officer called to the scene. This has changed a lot over the 20 years. This used to be a shop here. All right. Uh, and then in here used to be the main uh, uh, serving area. The kitchen where Barry was was here. And uh, it hasn't changed a great deal. This kitchen is almost, almost the same as it was when uh, Barry was found here. This is a weird feeling. Nigel Cruttenden had 14 years forensics experience. Gruesome scenes were the bread and butter of his job but nothing could prepare him for what he found in Barry Sudane's kitchen. These are the actual police photos taken by DS Cruttenden. They show that whilst the top half of Barry Sudane's body was burnt away, the kitchen he lay in was untouched. One of his hands had burnt so much they'd have fallen off and touched the, the edge of the uh, unit down here and actually burnt it. That was part of the only real bit of burning there was, and that was just a char. The scene bore the two classic hallmarks of a so-called spontaneous combustion. Firstly, a massively burnt body with no sign of an obvious fuel source like petrol to explain it. Secondly, despite the body suffering a catastrophic fire, the surroundings, including a flimsy dustpan and brush right next to him, escaped unscathed. Officially, there's no such thing as spontaneous human combustion, but the inquest into Barry's death couldn't clear the matter up. It returned an open verdict, meaning the death was still unexplained. Supporters of spontaneous human combustion claim the phenomenon is responsible for three things. Ignition. It's said that people randomly and spontaneously catch fire for no apparent reason. Fuel. Once ignited, the fire burns for long enough and hot enough to reduce most of the body to just ash. Contained destruction. Why do victims' legs remain? And even weirder, why are the areas the victims burn in hardly touched by the fire? So first up, I need to find a source of spontaneous ignition. It may not have the power of a regular electrical current, but there's a significant history of static discharges starting fires. 
In 1985, in the north of England, Jacqueline Fitzsimon shocked fellow college students when she seemingly burst into flames between classes. Neil Gargan was one of the stunned passers-by. Returning from lunch, a colleague and I, uh, we entered the college building, walked up to the first floor landing. We passed four girls. They all seemed quite normal and quite happy. It was only like when we got, say, five or six yards further away, we heard the scream turn around and there she was. It seemed like everything went into slow motion for a, a few seconds. Myself and a colleague managed to take our jumpers off and put the fire out. Although it seemed to take a long time, it actually was over very, very quickly. There was nothing anybody else really could have done. Tragically, two weeks after the fire, Jacqueline died of blood poisoning. But how the seemingly spontaneous fire had ignited remained a mystery. So could it have been triggered by a static spark? To discover what damage electricity can do, I decided to start big at the School of Engineering, Cardiff University. This impulse generator is capable of delivering half a million volts of electricity and flashing over a gap of nearly a metre long. So it's a pretty safe bet that if electricity alone is the cause of spontaneous fires, then this machine has the power to ignite pretty much anything. I was only allowed to spark one bolt from the beast, so I had to choose my victim carefully. But the sacrificial lamb stood out like a 1980s fashion crime. A very furry, woolly jumper. To save me from spontaneous electrocution, I was kept well within the protective earthed cage. No such safety for our mohair jumper. The alarm told us the generator was nearing maximum voltage. Hey! Oh! Oh! <laughs> Just the result I wanted. Half a million volts can cause a serious blaze. But no human could generate that sort of power. Or could they? A static charge is invisible. So you might not know you've picked one up until you discharge it, as this American woman found out. Re-entering her car, she acquired enough of a charge to spark petrol vapor into a terrifying blaze. Luckily, she survived this spontaneous ignition. But was it a one-off? Or could static power help disprove the first part of the spontaneous combustion phenomenon? I'm going to see how many volts I can generate by wearing particular materials which could pose a serious hazard to my health. Are we all just an accident of fashion away from a static electrical discharge or even spontaneous human combustion? Cotton sweatbands, a nylon bodysuit, rubber wellies and PVC gloves. Excellent. By rubbing myself like this, what I'm trying to do is create a, a negative or a positive charge by um, either shedding or gaining electrons off the various materials which I'm covered in. I'm literally rubbing myself up the wrong way. Because the voltage that I've acquired is unstable, it's going to seek to earth itself at the next available opportunity. Well, in this outfit, about the most that I can uh, get away with is 7,000 volts, because that's all I can generate in this kind of clothing. It's enough to give me a nasty, niggly little shock, but not enough to harm me from the electricity alone. However, what would happen if I came into contact with something flammable? The fire investigation heard evidence from witnesses that just prior to the blaze, Jacqueline had applied some hairspray. Could my static spark produce a different outcome on a hairspray-soaked garment 
similar to the one Jacqueline was wearing that day.